Good evening. Thanks for joining us. I'm Dwayne Brown. A hometown hero and former star linebacker for the San Diego Chargers was found dead in his Oceanside home this morning. Police are investigating the death of Junior Seau as a suicide. He was found by his girlfriend who called police around 9.30 this morning. Oceanside Police Chief Frank McCoy. She indicated that she returned to the residence to find Mr. Seau unconscious, suffering from a gunshot wound to the chest. Oceanside Police Department and Fire Department responded to this residence where we located Mr. Seau in one of the bedrooms. Life-saving efforts were formed on Mr. Seau. However, they were not successful. Chief McCoy says a handgun was found near Seau's body. His mother, Luisa Mauga Seau, was shocked to hear the news after trying to reach her son earlier in the week. Monday, Tuesday, me and my, my husband come over here visit him, but he out of town. He talking to me. He's joking to me. He got me a home. Him and his daddy, now, I hear the bad voice on a Wednesday morning. He never said something for me. Judah, hey, why are you never telling me you going? And I pray to God, take me, take me, leave my son alone. Alone, alone. Police say there's no indication of foul play and there was no suicide note found at the scene and they couldn't confirm if the gun found near Seau's body was registered to him. Seau was 43 years old and leaves behind four children. He's also the eighth member of the San Diego Chargers' lone Super Bowl team who has died all before the age of 45. KPBS reporter Jose Luis Jimenez has this profile of his career. Seau was born in January 1969 in San Diego. He grew up in the North County and excelled at sports at Oceanside High School. He later accepted a football scholarship at the University of Southern California. In 1990, the linebacker was taken in the first round of the NFL draft by his hometown team, the San Diego Chargers. Give me five. You gave me good luck last time. And anchored the defense for 12 years. He helped lead the team to its only Super Bowl appearance in 1994, where they lost to the San Francisco 49ers. He was traded to the Miami Dolphins, where he played for three years. Seau retired in 2006 for one day. He returned to the NFL with the New England Patriots, but never got the championship he was chasing. The superstar left pro football in 2009 after 20 years. Seau championed many causes through his Junior Seau Foundation, which has raised about $4 million. But in 2010, an arrest on suspicion of domestic violence marred his image. Hours after the arrest, Seau drove his SUV off of a cliff at a Carlsbad beach. Seau's explanation was that he fell asleep at the wheel. The domestic violence case was later dropped. Say I was being remembered as happy, positive, and always willing to help. San Diego Hall of Champions in Balboa Park is the largest multi-sport museum of its kind in the nation. It also recognizes some of San Diego's greatest sports legends. Alan Kidd is president of the museum. He joins us from the KPBS News Center. San Diegans and sports fans, Al, are obviously shocked about the death of Junior Seau. What comes to mind when you think about the star linebacker from Oceanside? Well, Dwayne, he, uh, he had an inspiration and a passion about him that, that carried everywhere he went, whether it was on the athletic field or ultimately in the classroom, uh, with the clinics he did for kids, with the philanthropy that he did around the city of San Diego. And, and that passion was contagious, and he was a bigger-than-life creature out there. And people just loved hanging around Junior. And he was one of the most favored guys to bring out to these philanthropic events to help organizations raise money. And a big part of his passion uh, was for kids, particularly kids in his Oceanside community and Samoan community and, and the inner city of San Diego. And, and we at the Hall of Champions used Junior in a number of different kinds of events, uh, mainly aimed at kids and trying to raise money to give some of these kids uh, better opportunities that their peers may, not have, uh, that may have had over them. And as I mentioned, uh, the hall is really uh, a place for inspirational sports legends, many from San Diego. But Seau isn't in the hall at this stage, right? Right. And uh, the unfortunate timing of this situation um, is that he, it, part of the regulations that we have for induction in our Hall of Fame is that the athlete needs to be retired a number of years, three years to be exact. And, and he was up uh, to be inducted this year, and uh, I have absolutely no doubt that he would have been in an selection and, and, and still will be. Uh, it's just that this year 
uh, honoring him uh, will be under different circumstances. But everything he had done in the field uh, certainly deserves to be uh, honored in the Hall of Champions on a permanent basis. And, and if you could, in a nutshell, what kind of legacy do you think he leaves San Diego? Well, he leaves San Diego as one of our few ambassadors. Every great city has great people, and there's great people who are in the business community, in the sports community, in the philanthropic community. And Junior transcended a number of those greatness areas. And uh, when you travel around the country, people knew Junior Seau. There's very few athletes or people who attain the level of what I consider kind of a city ambassador. And, and Junior became one of those people. And not only in his community here in San Diego did people revere him, but as he traveled around the country, uh, Junior Seau was a name that in nearly any city in America, people would have some type of reverence for the passion and the inspiration that he played his sport. Uh, so I think we're losing one of our great ambassadors and, and one of the great icons of San Diego, at least in our recent time since I've been here since 1978. Alan Kidd, president of the San Diego Hall of Champions, thank you so much. Thank you. San Diego Chargers say they are shocked over Seau's death, and the news drew hundreds of fans to his home in Oceanside. Others went to his Mission Valley restaurant to leave flowers. And earlier today on KPBS Midday Edition, we talked with North County Times sports columnist Jay Paris. Something was obviously up, and, and I, I, when you play without much emotion, and Junior was an emotional guy, you know, sometimes those guys are on roller coasters, and, and it seems Junior got down about something, and wasn't able to get the help he needed. San Diego Mayor Jerry Sanders says Seau was, quote, one of the most electrifying athletes in San Diego sports history. He also praises Seau's charitable work, saying it did so much good in so many ways. And the president of the San Diego Padres issued a statement as well, calling Seau, quote, a great San Diegan and an inspiration. The Padres started today's game with a moment of silence. For more about the life and death of Junior Seau, go to our website, kpbs.org. This is KPBS Evening Edition. Tonight on KPBS at 8, see how baby animals in the wild learn whom to trust, what to fear, and when to act, all in the first days of life on Nature Born Wild. Then at 9 on NOVA, scientists build a computer to rival the human brain, then match it against intelligent humans on Jeopardy. And at 10 on America Revealed, how manufacturing is changing to a system in which ideas and information are the raw materials. That's tonight on KPBS. In the last year, KPBS News has been honored with nearly three dozen awards. I'm extremely proud of these honors, and I thank you for your support as we continue to serve our local communities with award-winning news coverage in the years to come. I'm Jeffrey Brown. On the next News Hour, the challenges of teaching climate science. That's Wednesday on the PBS News Hour. KPBS Evening Edition is made possible by Joan and Irwin Jacobs and by The FBI says it's uncovered a scheme to produce fake driver's licenses at Department of Motor Vehicle offices in El Cajon and Rancho San Diego. Four DMV workers are accused of taking bribes of up to $3,000 in exchange for fake licenses to people who either failed or didn't take their driver's test. Agents also arrested the head of a driving school in El Cajon and 16 people accused of paying the bribes. California is one of five states where juvenile detention staff are allowed to carry pepper spray. Now, a new report suggests the staff may be using pepper spray too often. Amitha Sharma and her guests are talking about that. The report contrasts pepper spray use between San Diego and L.A. juvenile halls and contains interviews of former staff members. The reporter who's investigated this story is Dave Moss of San Diego City Beat. Dave, let's start with some basics. How many juvenile facilities are there in San Diego? And break it down in terms of boys and girls. There are five facilities in total. Two of them are juvenile halls. Uh, one of those juvenile halls contains all boys, and the other one contains a mix of boys and girls. And then there are 
two that are considered rehabilitation facilities. They're sort of camp-like facilities. Uh, and then there's one that's just for girls. Whose responsibility is it to run these facilities? There is the San Diego County Probation Department is in charge of the facilities. And there's also the Juvenile Justice Commission, which serves as a watchdog over those facilities. Now, what did you find out about the number of times that pepper spray is being used in San Diego County? System-wide, there were more than 461 incidences of pepper spray being used in the facilities. Uh, at one of the facilities, East Mesa, we found that it was being used uh, five times a week on average. Now, what are the effects of the pepper spray and under what types of circumstances is the spray being used? Uh, pepper spray is considered a chemical restraint. Uh, that is the chemical equivalent of, say, shackles. Uh, you spray it into a kid's face, his eyes swell up, mucus starts pouring out of his nose, they double over in pain. And it's used in San Diego primarily to stop fights or to you know, prevent fights, but also for things like room extractions. When a kid refuses to leave his room, use the pepper spray to get him out of there. I should say that we have a statement from Chief Probation Officer Mac Jenkins. He says, quote, pepper spray is a tool that staff can use in situations such as a fight or an assault where there is an immediate risk to the safety of youth or staff. Staff is trained to use it only when necessary, when other options such as giving directions or counseling have been attempted and failed, or when the urgency of the situation does not allow for them. We also regularly use the assistance of juvenile forensic staff when possible to help us deal with upset, angry, or out-of-control youth. In every use of OC spray, affected youth are seen and examined by medical staff. OC spray is used as an alternative to physical force by staff to stop fights, assaults, or on other youth, or attempted assaults on staff. Under one of the, the surprising statistics in your article is how much the pepper spray is used. How much more is it used in San Diego than in Los Angeles? Okay, so comparing the two, the three Los Angeles facilities to San Diego's two uh, juvenile halls, in Los Angeles County, it was used 91 times in 2011. In San Diego, it was used 378 times in those two facilities. So what sorts of explanations are you hearing about the contrast? Uh, you know, uh, L.A. County came to where it is now because it had been under a uh, Department of Justice investigation and signed an agreement with the Department of Justice to bring it down over 10 years. That's how they got down to, to 91. Probation hasn't been, you know, wholly forthcoming talking to us about this issue, but arguments that could be made are that, well, there were only two staff injuries last year, so it's protecting staff, reducing workman's comp claims, things like that. Now, you did speak to some former staff members who described the effects on education of using the pepper spray. What did they say? We spoke to one teacher uh, who had been in there for uh, several months in 2009, and he said it creates this, this environment of, of control where pepper spray is being used to enforce you know, all matters of discipline. But every time they use it, it disrupts everything. Classes were canceled on a regular basis because you spray, drop pepper spray, it's like dropping a bomb. Even though there are kids who weren't exactly sprayed, they still have to clean it out. There are kids who are still affected. And in fact, one former staffer told you that the use, when you use pepper spray, it makes for an enemy for life. What he, did he mean by that? He, he regretted ever having to use it. And he had said that even now, years out of, the, out of the facility, that he still runs into kids who hate him because he sprayed them, because it is exacting pain. And I had one, one uh, expert in my story who said that you can't, you can't do a motivational interview with someone when you have pepper spray attached to your belt. It just creates an oppositional environment when in a rehabilitative se setting, you do need to have a sort of teamwork and rapport between staff and youth. Dave Moss, thank you so much for speaking to us today. Thank you. Colombia's ambassador to the U.S. was in San Diego recently to promote the free trade agreement between the two countries. The deal officially takes effect in two weeks. From our front terrace desk, Jill Replico talks with Ambassador and former Colombian Defense Minister Gabriel Silva about the trade agreement and the drug war. Colombia has been promoted as a regional success story in terms of the growth of its economy and improvements in public safety. What has, what has the country done to make that happen? Well, I think that the most important component of what we have done is that Colombians decided to push back push back organized crime, push back on drug trafficking, push back on terrorism. And the country united 
around this cause of recovering our nation, recovering our territory, recovering our rights. Colombia uh, is a very rich country in terms of minerals, land, and uh, so we have the, the components to, to make things happen, but violence was like a deterrence. It was like a Berlin Wall. We really, really need to tear that wall to allow these forces, these economic forces to, to grow, to uh, expand, and we're still fighting that, that uh, uh, battle, but the progress has been immense. Many experts have drawn parallels between what um, Mexico is, is going through right now and what Colombia went through in the past few decades. What, what has Colombia learned in the battle against um, drug trafficking and production? And, and what sort of lessons do you think the country has for um, Mexico? I would say that there are three lessons that explain why Colombia was able to, to turn the page and, and move ahead. The first is that we have a centralized police force. And that's, the, that's a problem for many countries, including Mexico, where they have five levels of police force, from the municipal to the federal, and there are all kinds of, of interacting, competing forces that are difficult to organize and coordinate and allows for corruption. Uh, the, other, the other lesson that we learn is that you have to pay with your own resources and have the elites pay for improving the overall security picture. Because one of the problems is that people decide to protect themselves, and they hire bodyguards and armor cars and build walls and turn the, around their homes. But sooner or later, the issue of public safety for everyone turns to be the real, the real problem. So you need to commit resources. You need to tax the rich people. And they have to pay for the security, not their own security, but the country's security. Third lesson is that when you start a process of fighting back, organized crime tends to uh, weaken the resolve of the people, doing horrible things and threatening and, and proposing ideas that don't work, like legalization or, or peace treaties between the state and the mafias. And uh, it's, 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 easy, it's easy to follow on those traps because uh, the task is so, so huge, so humongous. And during the recent Summit of the Americas, Colombian President Juan Manuel Santos talked about the need to look at alternatives in the way where we've been fighting the drug war. What are some of those alternatives? Well, what we have said is that that's a legitimate debate, but it cannot be used as an excuse to stop doing what you have to do. And uh, But that's a debate that is actually just starting. And it has to be a non-ideological debate. You need to go to the facts and see what is working, what is not, through experts, uh, take, investing a lot of intellectual capital and research. Is legalization of at least some illicit drugs a viable option for a country like Colombia or for the region? It, it can only be done as a global decision. Because if you legalize in one country and not as a international uh, policy, then what you do is to create a haven for, for drug traffickers and organized crime. And everyone will move into that country very happily and operate from there. As you mentioned, we know the free trade agreement with, um, between Colombia and the United States is set to go into effect on May 15th. Uh, what kind of opportunities are there for um, both consumers and business people in Southern California? Well, I have to tell, to tell you and your audience that sometimes I am frustrated by the fact that California thinks that Latin America ends up in Mexico. And uh, I love Mexico, I have very good friends in Mexico, but I think that's uh, an attitude that uh, creates uh, uh, or, or actually allows for mission opportunities and for, for allows for not understanding the potential beyond Mexico. Colombia is l larger than Malaysia, Singapore, Hong Kong, Sweden, Switzerland. And uh, we, our income per capita doubled in a decade. So we're ready for American products. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Well, Jill, thank nice you very much. She was the first woman appointed to the U.S. Supreme Court. Coming up next to talk with retired Justice Sandra Day O'Connor. This is KPBS Evening Edition. The gun is his idea. I I'm just, uh, you know. My hostage. Hostage, yes, that works. Don't do that. 
do. The look. You're doing the look again. I like detectives. Brain is the new sexy. He wants to destroy me inch by inch. Can't you see what's going on? Having fun? I wouldn't miss this for the world. The new season of Sherlock on Masterpiece. A new season of Sherlock premieres Sunday at 9 on KPBS Television. Hi, I'm Elsa Sevilla. If you find yourself hearing about a great program on KPBS after it's already aired, we have a solution. Get notified about your favorite TV programs on KPBS before they air by subscribing to the TV Highlights email alert. This daily email will feature the best programs coming up right here on KPBS TV, so you can make a date to tune in or plan to record it. It's easy to register. Just go to kpbs.org slash alerts. Nearly seven years ago, Justice Sandra Day O'Connor retired from the U.S. Supreme Court. Now 82 years old, the first woman appointed to the high court has started a nonprofit to teach children civics. Amitha Sharma spoke to her about how women justices are changing the court and how the public's view of the court is changing. Justice O'Connor, thank you so much for speaking to us today. Well, I'm pleased to be here. You started iCivics to reverse the decline in civic knowledge among Americans. Yes. How do you plan to do that? We got public schools in America maybe 20 to 25 years after the framers had developed our new form of government and got us our constitution and so forth. And it was thought that we needed public schools to teach young people how the government works. The framers had created this wonderful system, and it was important to teach every succeeding generation how it worked. That's why we got public schools. For years, those public schools taught civics. They thought that was imperative, that that's why we had schools. In recent years, more states have stopped teaching civics at all. We are teaching more math and more science and a lot of other things, but not civics. And frankly, it is imperative that every generation of young people learn how our government works and how they, as citizens, are part of it and can make it work for them, too. And so I've been very involved in trying to have uh, a program that young people find interesting and will play as a game. Young people spend about 40 hours a week in front of a screen, TV and or a computer. I only need about an hour. An hour would do for me. And I can teach them how our government works with iCivics. And they'll love what they're doing. You were the first woman appointed to the U.S. Supreme Court, and now there are three others, Justices. I know. It's amazing when I go in the courtroom today and sit there and look up and see three. It's quite exciting. Well, how has the presence of women changed the court, or has it? It hasn't changed the decisions. It's changed the public perception of the court. You know already that probably 51 or 52 percent of our citizens are female. You knew that, didn't you? Yes. And does it make a difference as a female to look around you at public bodies and see that women are represented, well represented on those bodies? Yes. That's why it matters. The Pew Research Center recently came out with a poll showing that 52% of Americans have a favorable view of the Supreme Court. That's at a 25-year low. Why do you think that is? I don't know. It probably has to do with your kind of work. When reporters give unfavorable accounts of what courts are doing, I wouldn't know. It tends to follow the news or the analytical reports that people read. Then they tend to say, oh, something's wrong. I wouldn't know. How has the Supreme Court been so successful at maintaining secrecy? There are lots of clerks and lots of staff, and yet we never... Well, the court is not at all secret. It is the only branch of government when every decision is fully explained in a written decision. You can't go to a single committee of Congress or any other branch of government where every decision is fully written out and explained, as it is in the Supreme Court. What I meant was we don't hear about leaks on rulings before well, they they're don't talk announced. about them until they're agreed upon and the dots are signed. People have put their signature on. 
And that's appropriate because it isn't a decision of the court until all of them have voted. How much attention do the Supreme Court justices pay to the, the legal analysts and the pundits who try Probably to predict? None. I would say almost zero. They aren't deciding cases based on uh, media reports or opinions expressed by analysts. They decide it based on precedent, Supreme Court precedents, on the language of the statutes they're interpreting, and on the long history of cases the court already has. So it, they are not reading uh, media reports to make decisions. In fact, they avoid them. How much do oral arguments sway the they justices? Matter. They matter. But most of it is based on the written briefs that are filed. You can cover much more in the written brief. It isn't brief at all. It's a long written argument. You can cover more in that than you can in a short half hour of oral argument that's interrupted by questions. So most of what they learn, they learn from the written briefs that are filed. And very quickly, why aren't Supreme Court oral arguments televised? Because the justices haven't authorized it. It is fully reported by that same evening. You can get an entire written transcript of everything that was said in the courtroom. So it's not like we're missing anything. You can get it all in writing. You can't see it on the television because the members of the court haven't agreed to it. They don't want to be media figures. They want to do their work uninterrupted by media attention. Justice O'Connor, thank you so much for spending some time with us today. You're welcome. Tonight in our public square, tributes are pouring in for former San Diego Charger Junior Seau. He was found dead at his Oceanside home, and police are investigating it as a suicide. The 12-time Pro Bowler is being remembered as one of the greatest linebackers who ever played the game. One viewer wrote, So sad, here's a guy that was a hero to so many. Another said, I can't believe it. Great player, better person. And this comment, Remember watching Junior Seau with my dad as a kid, one of the best ever number 55. You can send us your remembrances through Facebook, Twitter, or email us. You can also visit our website for all the day's news, kpbs.org. Thank you so much for joining us. Good night.